So, well, th thanks everyone. Uh, and th thanks Radhika for that introduction. So cooking for me has been something I picked up probably, you know, in the last 15 years or so. Uh, like a lot of us where, you know, <laughs> we've, uh, at least only when I started uh, you know, being a student and living on my own, I had to kind of forage for food. It was too expensive to eat out. And so then, you know, you naturally you're drawn to cooking because it's the only way to eke out uh, a sustenance. But then slowly as, you know, even then I, as I got a job or something like that, it it just became second nature because of, you know, the start that we had. So also being vegetarian, it helped uh, because a lot of places that I went, there would just be one item on the menu. So I'm like, screw this. I might as well just do something on my own rather than um, eat something like that. So that's how the, the journey, at least for me, started. And then from there, you know, I, today I, I'm decent enough. I can make quite a few things. Uh, it's fun and so on. So um, on that note, I uh, wa wanted to just start off with some really basic things and then we can see how things go. Uh, we can take it uh, where we want to go. So I have, let's see, um, I have like a very brief outline right now. Uh, it's obviously pretty fluid, uh, you know, based on if we see how comments are going, we can skip some things. If people think it's too uh, boring, we can uh, chop and change. No worries there. So they just want to touch up on things like, why do we cook? You know. What type of cooks are you? We're trying to understand recipes, measurements, things, things like that. Uh, we're going to talk a little about some kitchen tools, which are absolutely the, the must. Uh, and then what goes into choosing ingredients. And then, of course, our most important friends, time and temperature. So that's kind of the general outline um, I have here. And then uh, we'll see what, uh, how, how this goes. Okay. So the first one is, why do we cook? Now, the way at least I think about it is that uh, approaching food is like a puzzle or code and should no be no different in the kitchen. So you understand what you actually have. You understand what you're actually asked to do. You break it down to in individual steps and then you explore the different possibilities for each of these steps. Let's say something like making coffee, for example. Uh, you know, you isolate the variables. There is the bean, there is a grinding, there is a temperature, there is the pressure that is required. And then you explore the combination in a controlled way by you change one variable at a time. And then you think about the ingredients that you're starting with and the end state that you want. And then as opposed to like a straight up execution of the recipe, you know, you can, your recipe kind of veers away into something else. So you first make the coffee the regular way you do, but then you start tinkering with different things. And which is why I guess, you know, today there are so many different kinds of beans and coffee so many different ways to make coffees. It's probably because of that. Uh, you know, now you're open to a plethora of possible outcomes and the way a meal turns out will be different from what you originally conceived, but that's kind of like how you go, right? So you think about the end state and that'll help you broaden what you think about cooking more generally, because cooking is not just food in a pan, you know, you think about why do we cook? Um, sometimes you're cooking because you're watching your waste, you're watching your wallet. You know, health and finances are common considerations. Are you building a community like the potlucks uh, or, you know, shared meals or barbecues? Those are fun social activities. And, you know, they also kind of spur friendly uh, competition. You know, are you expressing love? Because cooking can also is, is an act of giving both in the literal sense of like sustenance but also in the spiritual sense of sharing time, companionship, and coming together to eat. Um, or, you know, are you trying out new things? Because there are plenty of foods that you cannot order in a restaurant um, or, you know, or you want to get closer to the source of the food, in which case it, it, learning is really nice to see how a lot of these dishes come together. And for example, if you're trying to, you watch something on TV, you're just, this you saw this cuisine from, from another culture, but then you can relate to it because it's kind of similar to things that you've grown up with. That's when you can experiment and see what you want to do, right? Regardless of your reason for cooking. Uh, you, there's one, the most important thing is to realize that there is more to cooking than just following a recipe. You know, when looking at the end goal, think beyond the cooking stage. Like if your reason for cooking is to express affection, then you have to consider the sensations of that your food brings to the guests and the perception and reactions that they will have, because that adds as much to the cooking as the, the dish itself. Or if you're cooking primarily for health and financial reasons, 
then the quality of the food, the price of the ingredients, that's what you know, is more important to you. So that's where I'm trying to get to. It's important to see what, why do you, you cook? And then based on that, you, you, your choices of what you make along the way uh, kind, of, kind of get affected. So then the next slide is this guy. So what type of a cook are you? Right? And this is also important because based on where you slot yourself will kind of affect the, a lot of the choices that you make. So I've kind of put them as like five for now. There could be probably four or some of you could find yourself in, you know, as combinations of two or so on. Uh, the first one is, you know, the soul cook, the soul people, the soul cooks who make with their heart. They're giving. They are people who see the food they make. It's like giving love. They tend to be great, you know, bakers. A lot of our moms fall under that category. Uh, you, you see a lot of traditional recipes. Uh, there won't be too much tweaking or changing or something like that. But oh, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, you know, th but then they, the most. It may be healthy, may not be healthy, but at the end of the end, it, it, just, it just feels right. Uh, the second category is your health freaks or the, you know, uh, the, the healthy cooks. And it's not surprising that, you know, they will sacrifice taste or something else just to make something healthy. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it's easy to spot someone. They, they'll be constantly telling you about how many steps they took. Uh, you know, they're the most fittest person in the group or so on. And more likely, they'll, they'll always have like a herb garden or something like that in their, uh, in their kitchen. The third group, and I know personally a lot of people who fall into this, is your methodical cook. You know, they, they make everything, but it has to be in front. There has to be a cookbook in front of them. And they need to have all the ingredients laid out. They make it exactly the way it should be. And then they'll probably even get disappointed if it doesn't turn out to just like how the picture in that blog or on TV looked like, you know, they were like, oh, this is a failure or something like that. Uh, so that's that, uh, that set of cooks. And then your fourth category is the, the innovative kind of a cook. You know, they cook by second nature. They, they'll use a recipe or a cookbook, but it's still just more look at the picture and say, yeah, I think I can make it. Uh, and they're creative in a lot of areas in life. And for them, cooking is more like, like an art, like doing a painting or an artist, you know, composing a song where they're like, okay, I'm getting some inspiration. I think I have these things that I want to work with. And then you kind of go, it's more like it's a, it's an expressive release. Um, and a lot of those cooks, you know, their, their egos are pretty light. So it's because they know, you know not everything's going to turn out the way they try to be, but then like, yeah, it's okay. It'll work out the next time. The fifth group, this is, this is interesting. The fifth group is the people who are the, the iron chefs of, you know, they like to call themselves. They want to, they want to cook more for them. Cooking is more like a performative, uh, a performative expression than anything else. They're cooking to impress other people, uh, not just themselves or what. So you'll see them using a lot of techniques like sous vide and, you know, all, all the uh, spherification and all these things, just be, not just because it adds something to the, something to the dish, you know, or like uh, charcoal or, you know, all these smoke effects and things, but, at the end of the day, you won't remember what you ate at that person's house, but you will definitely remember that, you know, that person brought this charcoal and put it or put a bowl on top of it. And wow, that was so amazing. That's that the, you know, that's, that's that uh, last category that I like to call them. The, the next why I wanted to start. So now that you know what kind of a cook you are, you know, everyone listening probably will probably fit into one of those. And we were kind of established why do we cook? Uh, let's think about understanding a recipe uh, and measurements and so on, because recipes are like code, right? And they require some interpretation. So read the recipe top to the bottom as many times as you like. And so I tell people, read the recipe. Okay. It's okay to go off a recipe. In fact, it's a really nice way to learn uh, if you're doing it intentionally, because sometimes you may not have all the ingredients. You want to substitute something else. Uh, Sometimes the recipe, you know, the measurements you don't make sense to you. So you want to change them very much like programming, right? Uh, you know, you think that there is more than one way to, to solve a problem and you could do it differently. A recipe, let's say, is not a strict protocol, but it is important to understand the protocol that it is trying to, in the protocol before you deviate from it. 
um, there's a lot of room for personal preference, obviously, like just because, uh, let's say, for example, a recipe for um, hot chocolate says half a cup of cream, one cup of milk, doesn't mean you need to use those exact quantities the same way. Uh, or let's say a brownie or a chocolate chip cookie recipe says walnuts. You don't have walnuts. You want to use almonds. Almonds will taste pretty good in a brownie or a chocolate chip cookie too. You're fine. But read the recipe, read as many recipes as you can, because not all recipes are the same. And so you'll kind of, once you read a lot of recipes, you'll kind of get an idea of what this dish is going to be. So let's say you're making something like a dal makhani. Go read five, six blog posts. They all will have different ways to do the dal makhani. But between the five, six people, you'll find a common thread of what they're trying to do. And you may make one of the five or you'll come up with your own sixth version, but do read recipes. Uh, and then we come to our friends with uh, cups and spoons. A lot of these recipes will have two cups of this, four tablespoons of that, one teaspoon of this. And you're lost at this because not all cups are the same. Like, you know, it's not like the international system of units is selling cups, calibrated cups to everyone. So everyone's cups differ. Uh, everyone's spoons are bigger and smaller. And therefore, weights are probably a better one to do, especially like for, which is why in a lot of baking recipes, you'll see things go by weight. But when you're just, you know, cooking dinners or lunches, a lot of recipes are in cups, which is fine, but just make sure you kind of understand what you're doing. Um, now, for example, let's say uh, by going by the, the international units, a cup of milk weighs 256 grams and that's 237 ml. But a lot of recipes are just going to round up or round down and that's what you get. So it's okay yeah, if things are in cups and spoons, but just make sure you understand what you're doing and you can change and chop as required. Uh, same thing goes for stoves. And this is my biggest gripe with a lot of recipes, uh, which will just say, saute this for five minutes. Five minutes on your stove is a lot different from five minutes on my stove right? because stoves have something called the BTU, which is the British thermal unit. And that's the one BTU will raise the heat of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, that's the output that your stove is giving you. And every stove has a different uh, BTU level and therefore the heat that they gave out. So let's say, look, okay, saute something on medium for three minutes. Your medium is different from my medium. And so therefore three minutes on your stove is obviously going to differ for me. Uh, and that's where you want to, you know, not, you still want to get the general idea of what they're doing, but not just like, okay, it's three minutes and then switch the stove off. You don't want to do that because people have nowadays induction stoves. There are electric stoves, with, uh, so on. And in electric stoves, at least the heating power is measured in Watts, right? And not BTUs. So a Watt is like, three and a half BTUs per hour or something like that. So like what, what I'm trying to get here is they're all different and it's important that you're, which is why you're reading a lot of recipes because you may say, okay, this person had three minutes in here, this person had five minutes and you can kind of get the general, you can try to get a consensus on how much time you want to be going for, at least the first time. Uh, and then come our friends ratio and proportion. Uh, a lot of times it will say, you know, Two, two parts of water for three parts of this, or like, especially in making pasta, it will say like your ratio of eggs to flour should be three to two or, or something like that. And it's important to get that, but also do that mental math because you're not making for so, for so many people. A lot of time just making just for yourself or just, or just two people. And a recipe will have these ratios because it's catering to, let's say 10 people or six people. So that's when you need to kind of, tone back and say, okay, how much is three by two? How much is this? How much is six by eight? And you bring it down because you're trying to make it just for one person or else you'll end up with a batch, like a vat full of dal makhani and not knowing what to do. I mean, your neighbors will be happy, I hope, but that's important. But the no matter what you do, how many recipes you look at, it's always important to read between the lines, right? And the reason why I'm saying I say that is because However bad or good a recipe is, you know, in terms of time or things, saying things like measurements and so on, you always want to look for cues in there. So that same recipe where someone said, uh, you know, saute the onions for five minutes on medium. I get that. 
but there, there may also be a sentence to say until they are translucent. So you that that's the that's the word you're looking for. You look for that and say, okay, I'm trying. They need to be translucent. So how long does it take to get translucent on my stove? You know, if you go by that, then you're safer. Those visual cues, you're safer than just going by uh, absolute limits that people give you. Uh, it's a lot easier when you, when you when you're looking at a video or on t on TV so because you know that's the cue you're looking for. Because they'll say, let's get a sear on these carrots. And when they flip them, you see the color has changed. So now you know this is the this is the color I'm going for. And you go for however long you need to sear your carrots to get that color that you're going for. Uh, uh, same thing. Let's say for example, you see a recipe that will say uh, turn off the heat in the middle of let's say you're making scrambled eggs, and in your mind you go turn off the heat. Well, how is how are eggs going to get scrambled if you turn off the heat? It requires heat, but it's that's where it it's important because eggs you know they're so uh, easy to cook that the residual heat from your skillet you know, will cook your egg. This way you don't make it rubbery, but you need to look for those cues or reading in between the lines to see what the recipe is kind of uh, implying rather than just following the recipe word for word. Um, so then let's see, the next thing we wanted to talk about was kitchen tools, right? And the most important kitchen tool um, is your knife. Uh, and it might seem silly as to why I'm, you know, extolling so much about knives. And like, even my mom, you know, when she when she was here, and she saw me using a chef knife, she's like, you're only cutting vegetables, you know, why do you need something like this? Uh, or, you know, some of my friends will make fun of me like, dude, you know, the, the, the guy making pow bhaji near the bus stop, uh, you know, he probably chops kilograms more of vegetables than you ever do like in an entire month. And he doesn't use a chef knife. He just has one of those really thin knives with a, you know, with that really sharp blade pointing out and so on. And I go, yes, I get it. But what you have to consider is that none of these people also have to be in front of a computer with a keyboard and a mouse for 10 hours a day for 30 hours for 30 years of their life. Right. So our lifestyles have changed. You know, a lot of you know, our wrists are used a lot in a lot more ways than they were used before. And therefore, when you're cooking, your knives become important because you want to do something which is again not not just from your from your wrist, but also you want to be doing it the most efficient way, saving time. Um, and in those, and I've told this many times, even on Twitter, on uh, is that the best knife you could buy is one of these you know the uh, it's available in every every store you'll see them right from the 90s you know they used to be actually in exhibitions and stuff but th this this knife is probably the best one the reason why you you know you use you're using the fulcrum you put what you want before it and then you just go chop 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 in this one motion so it's less force on your uh, on your wrists or anywhere else but physics is doing all the chopping for you uh, Max, uh, sir, yes. I think your presentation is showing the presenter's view rather than the thing. So, in, because I think people are not able to see the things. Oh, from. how do I? Um, sorry, one second. How do I do this? Uh, oh, oh, now I know. My bad. Um, But if it's trouble, I think we can just carry on. We don't need to uh, figure out why Zoom would not let me to change this. Uh, okay, I think I found the Zoom thing. There. Uh, is this better? Much better. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, folks. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that that's what I had. Okay. So, uh, and you're, you, you, like I said, you're letting physics do all uh, the cutting for you. Now, knives, if you think of them, like the knife, knife blades that you get at least uh, nowadays are manufactured two ways. It's either by forging or stamping. 
Forging blades are heavier because uh, they, they drag through and cut better through. Um, they are more material, they cut better. Stamped blades are lighter because of the alloys used and, you know, but they hold an edge longer. So there is no A greater than B, it's more com comes to what you prefer, right? The, the best knives then are your, uh, th 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 I'm calling this, like I said, the JV row of knives is the, the chef knife and a paring knife. Uh, and the reason why I say this is that these are, you probably, these are the only two tools you need and you'll be fine. Uh, now a chef knife is, the size can matter. It's a matter of preference. Uh, typically it's eight to nine inches long and you know, it has like a curved blade. So let's see, I have one right here. So it's, you know, you have this curved blade and it helps you to, uh, the way you do, the, the way you do it is the curved blade is what you use to go on um, on the board, right? So you do at least using the physics to get that rocking motion. And that way is you're putting less force on your wrist because you're not tuck, 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 hitting uh, the board. And uh, th that also helps you cut through and pull through foods, uh, so on. And uh, then you have your paring knife. Your paring knife is a smaller knife, like four inch, uh, like a four inch blade. Let's see something like this guy. Um, it, it has a four inch blade and it's good because it's easy to hold. You hold it like this with your finger. And then let's say you're cutting apples, right? You can use your finger, go through an apple or a bell pepper or something like that. Or if you want to make slits uh, on something, you know, you use the edge and then tuck, tuck, tuck. It's pretty much like a pencil, right? You can use it like a pencil and you could do what you want. Uh, it's probably, I probably use the, the paring knife a lot more than I even use uh, the chef knife for a lot of things when you're making small cuts and so on. And that, that grip tag design is what uh, you're going for. Now, uh, when it comes to knives, right, you can go from, at least in the States, let's say from $10 to all the way to $150, right? And this is where I tell people, like, don't go crazy about it. You know, someone will go online, they'll read about knives and like, oh yeah, this is perfect. I should get like this knife. They'll go get like a really expensive knife um, and not knowing how to use it. Because again, the things with really expensive knives is they're light, the, uh, the blades are really thin, and so they will chip away. And then now you have, you spend a hundred bucks on a knife um, and then you, you know, kind of broke, you've, you've had, you have chips on it. It's, I tell people, if you, if you're getting a knife, that's fine. Start out with something real inexpensive, you know, go to AliExpress or something like that. Get one of those knives from there. Once you kind of get the way of how you should be chopping a, on a, on a, on a knife, then you slowly can, you know, upgrade because uh, like I was saying, knives, come in multiple, like for example, if you look at the, the picture here, this knife, uh, these are what you call like a full tang knife, which means the knife blade extends all the way from here till the end and the handle is kind of riveted on the knife. So the knife has a full body versus, uh, you know, like a blade, which is just stuck into uh, the handle. So these knives are much better to hold, but then obviously because there's more metal involved, they're more expensive and so on. So. The, it it differs on um, what kind of a weight you like in your hand because not everyone wants like a really heavy knife. But um, whatever knife you get, right, just make sure they're sharp. And a lot of people think that you know sharp knives cause accidents. It's the reverse. It's actually a blunt knife that's going to cause you more accidents than a sharp knife, statistically at least. And I'll tell you the simple thing. Let's say you're cutting an onion, right? So I'm cutting an onion. And I put my knife on, on the onion, just like this. And if it's a sharp knife, right, it's just going to go right through the onion. But if it's not sharp, it can skip, it can slip along the surface of that onion. And now my fingers or something are more in danger of getting hurt because if it slips this way, I'm holding it and I'm hurting my, um, and, you know, you using your knuckles. Uh, and also the reason why a sharp knife, let's say for example, you're cutting tomatoes. If you're cutting tomatoes and if you find yourself sawing through cut a tomato, you don't have a sharp knife for sure. I mean, it's not a log of wood. It's not a block of cheese that you need to be sawing through to cut through. Tomato, you put, you have a tomato, go through a tomato, your knife should just go through tomato like butter or something like that. And if you're sawing on a tomato, that means you're applying, it's not the knife that's cutting the tomato, it's the force that your hand is applying, which is cutting your tomato, which your tomato will still get cut at the end of the day. But then 
your cutting board, you know, will look like a crime scene uh, because all the juice would kind of have splattered out. And uh, that's that's not what you want to go for, right? You want to chop these tomatoes. You just want to have, you want them to retain their shape and not, uh, you know, have this entire crime scene kind of situation uh, with you. So that's why knives are really important. And again, like I said, Try something small. Don't go for a really expensive knife. Don't go for like a forged, uh, forged knife with a full tang. Uh, a full tang is something like this, right? If you can see, the knife blade runs completely through and the handles are like on this. But again, you don't need to do something like that. I didn't at least. Like, I, I started out with really cheap, inexpensive knives, broke them, and then slowly as I realized, okay, how, this is how you take care of them, you do it. And I guess it doesn't matter you get an expensive knife or a cheap knife just make sure you get a knife sharpener because no matter what kind of a blade it is, again, expensive knives will hold their, uh, will, you know, probably made of much better German steel. They'll hold their edge a lot longer. Uh, a cheaper knife may not, but at the end of the day, if you have a knife sharpener, you have a sharp knife. Uh, no, whether you bought it for, you know, 10 bucks or a hundred bucks, you still have a sharp knife if you have a knife sharpener. And which is why you'll see a lot of these, uh, cooking shows or so on, you know, they'll have like um, a rod and then they'll just taking their knives and kind of sharpening them across the rod. So you don't need to get a rod. It's kind of more, it's more fancy than anything else. You can get a sharpener. We just go, you know, it's like a, like a block and just go through it three, four times and you're good. But if you do that, you'll have really sharp knives. And at the end of the day, what you want uh, when you're going through this is you want to cut all your vegetables or your pro or your meat or whatever in symmetrical sizes because when when let's say potatoes or carrots they're cut in the same size they all cook together because let's say if you if you're cutting uh, carrots and then one carrot is like you know this small and another piece of carrot is this big the time the, the their cooking times are going to vary and what you're going to have is either you're going to have the smaller pieces going to be burnt because you're trying to get the other pieces uh, on a sear or you're going to switch off the switch off the heat because the smaller pieces are getting burnt, but the bigger pieces, you know, will still be undone. So you want to go for symmetry, but then you want to have like a good knife or a sharp knife rather. Let's not use the word good to give you symmetrical cuts. Uh, then we have something known as the Japanese knives, you know, and anything the Europeans do, the Japanese always think they can do it better. Uh, the difference between a Japanese knife and a German knife is in the hardness of the steel, right? Japanese steel is harder, which means it's more difficult to sharpen, but <clears throat> it remains sharp for a longer period of time. German steel, on the other hand, is softer, which means it's, it's easier to sharpen, but it doesn't hold its sharpness for so long. Um, what you see here are the, the one on the top. Uh, this is a Santoku knife, and this is a Nakiri knife. Uh, you'll notice straight away, you know, their shapes are different and it's because how you use them kind of changes. Uh, a, a Santoku knife is a Japanese inspired design. It has a flat blade. <clears throat> uh, sorry. You'll see there's a thinner cross section and they are suited up. It's very much like a chef knife, like a chef knife, but it's not meant for your rocking motion um, or pulling through foods. But a lot of times you'll see them having a Granton edge. A Granton edge is what you see these kind of dots on it. And it's not just like a show thing. It's because what happens is when you're chop, when you're slicing something, um, you're going to have air pockets there. So the air pockets will ensure that, let's say if I'm thinly slicing, um, I don't know, tomatoes, for example, right? You're slicing a tomato. The tomato is not going to stick to your knife. It's just going to fall off because the air pocket that gets created versus on a chef knife, you know, they'll kind of get stuck and then you have to kind of wipe them off the knife. Um, you'll see that a lot, especially when you're doing uh, garlic, ginger, or uh, let's say scallions and so on. Uh, and then Japanese knives, they have like a thinner blade. So it's like a 15 degree blade versus like a 20 degree blade of a, of a German knife. So yeah, um, and they are smaller, so smaller hands, you know, you may prefer a, a Santoku versus a chef knife. Like I bought my mom a Santoku knife. She liked that a lot. Uh, of course, she was scared of my chef knife. Uh, but then, you know, Santoku is like, what, seven inches or something. She liked that a lot compared to like nine inches of a chef knife. Um, then we go into other knives. And 
one of the names I use a lot these days is, uh, you know, what's called a Chinese cleaver. And I, I want to make one thing clear. The Chinese cleaver that you're seeing, it's, it's, it's called a cleaver, but it's more of a misnomer. You know, it's shaped like a cleaver, but you use it very much like any of the, uh, like a thin knife that you do. You know, it's not for, it's, it's not like a butcher's knife for crushing bones and so on. Uh, but because of the size, it takes time to get used to, you know, compared to West uh, European knives or Japanese knives, because your hand, that's it. So here's, here's this guy. Your hand is at a higher uh, uh, height from where the board is. And therefore the way you cut uh, is di differs, you know, because you're cutting like this or, or you're going through food like this versus, you know, do the other motion that you would do. Uh, the, the, the things it becomes, once you start using them, you understand how deft they are, even though it's, it's a larger knife. But uh, what the biggest advantage here is that the weight, the, the weight of the knife does a lot of your cutting. So, you know, you, so you can, the weight, you can put the knife on something, the weight will take it, the gravity will pull it down. So you're using less pressure to kind of cut through something. Uh, and again, it takes used to, but it's really good. Also, because it has such a flat thing, it's easy to scrape things off the uh, off the board and put them into bowls and so on. Um, but like I said, whatever knife you get, <laughs> make sure you get a knife sharpener and you'll be fine. You don't have to, there's no uh, choice on what you use. But again, uh, using knives, using a chef knife or any of these are just easier on your wrist. And they're, you know, you're using less force because the knife, the tool is doing the work and not you. And when it comes to efficiency, that's what you want. You, you have tools and you want the tools to do the work. You don't want, you don't want yourself to work the tools to, uh, to do the job for you. Right. And once we've gone through uh, knives, the next most important thing that you need in your kitchen, and again, there's a lot of things that people sell, but the most important things at least is your knife and a set of uh, skillets and frying pans, right? And here is where this very interesting discussion comes and of how it's been sold to us by the media or so on, right? It's Teflon. Teflon is, all, is, is, the, is the more common name for polytetrafuroethylene or for this purpose of this, we'll call it PTFE. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, it's, it's not good, you know, it's carcinogenic and it's bad, you should not be using uh, Teflon, but hey, it's cheap, it's easy to produce, and you need to take a step back and try to understand what's really happening here. Now, again, yes, uh, the PTFE, it does melt. It melts at around 600 Fahrenheit, 300 centigrade, um, but, a lot of the things that you're cooking are not going that high. Now, again, if you're going to um, put it inside into the oven um, or, or under a broiler, yes, you're going to heat, you're going to touch that much uh, that that level of heat, and then the the Teflon coating is probably going to melt. But a lot of the daily cooking that you do, you don't hit that level of temperature. You should be fine. Um, now, for a say example, and um, you're you're making scrambled eggs in the morning again. You are using scrambled eggs now. Um, when you're groggy in the morning, you don't want to be sitting with a steel uh, skillet or an aluminum skillet because the heat the, and you and don't want to be kind of wo working with it so that it doesn't kind of stick to the bottom or you end up using way too much oil. In the morning, putting something on a nonstick pan, getting your other stuff done is fine. And, th and that's why, you know, it's like horses for courses use a variety of materials that you like, you know, nowadays I'm seeing a lot of people use ceramic as well, because it just looks good when you take pictures on Instagram and so on, but use whatever you like, just make, just make, as long as you know that it's not like A is better than B, they're all made for different uh, purposes, right? Which brings me uh, to the next thing of all the different kinds of metals, because you have when you go, if you go to a store, you'll see stainless steel pans, cast iron pans, copper pans, aluminum pans. And other than the look and feel, like what, what should you choose and why? You know, is there like a copper is better than steel or something like that? Because, you know, then you'll go back to, oh, you know, back in the day, everything used to be copper. So let's, let me just buy copper results. Um, it's probably not the right thing to do. Again, <clears throat> not not wrong, but just think about why you're doing what you're doing, right? So what's the deal with pans or uh, skillets that are made of different kinds of materials? 
the most important things you have is thermal conductivity, which is how quickly heat energy moves through a material and heat capacity, which is how much energy it takes to heat a material, which is the same of how much energy that material is going to give out, right? So pans that are made from materials with a lower conductivity, they take longer to heat because the energy applied from the burner takes longer to transfer upwards. Um, and this is why, you know, like pans with a lower thermal conductivity, as you can see here, like uh, stainless, oh, sorry, what is that? like stainless steel or cast iron, they take longer to heat up. You know, it's kind of sluggish because like you put, you put your uh, cast iron skillet or put your stainless steel skillet on the stove. You can actually put your hand on it. It's not going to burn immediately. It takes a while for it to heat up. Um, but then similarly, uh, let's say you're done. If you pull it off the stove, the, they will still, they'll still have enough uh, residual heat and will still be cooking. Hence example of the eggs uh, we took earlier versus, uh, versus something like aluminum and copper, which have a very high thermal conductivity, which means they heat up real quick, but they also lose heat that quick, right? So it's not a thing that copper is better than cast iron. It just depends upon what you're making, where if you need uh, and you make a choice of based on the dish or the recipe that you're making, sometimes copper is better than cast iron and vice versa. But there isn't a A is greater than B always, and all of these are uh, also rands in the race. So uh, try, to un try to think through of what's happening in a dish. Um, like, for example, when, I, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about, let's say you're doing, uh, you're doing potatoes, right? you're, you're roasting potatoes. A cast iron skillet is good for that, because you know, even when you turn it off, the heat will keep going and the potatoes will get crispier as you go. But for some, thing, for some of the other things that you do, copper might probably be the best because you want it to stop cooking the moment you lift it off heat. And uh, in that case, that's what you want to do. But think through that uh, as you make your choices and not just like a blind choice of someone told me this material is better than the other. Um, so then let's see. We've spoken about um, two of the most important tools, which is knives and pots and pans. And now let's kind of think about taste, right? Uh, because flavor is taste plus smell is what gives you flavor. And what is smell? We don't realize this, but we're actually wired to detect like a thousand different compounds. Um, and we can discern, let's say maybe 10,000 odors. Um, now, trained people like uh, a lot of these wine tasters and so on, they can actually, they've trained themselves to de detect almost 10,000 uh, odors. But for the common nose, you know, we're probably around 1,000. And in smell or the, or the olfactory sense or olfaction is based on the sensory cells in your nose, which are chemoreceptors. They are turned on by chemical compounds. And these chemical compounds, we're calling them as odorants, right? So odorants turning on these chemoreceptors is what gives you smell. Um, and in cooking, you know, you only smell the volatile compounds in a dish, um, which is why, let's say when you, uh, you know, you, you, you put some oil and then you add like hing and kadi patta, um, uh, so on, you know, you see the, the aromatics, you get the smell. Uh, also, like when you add turmeric uh, into the oil and you, you let it bloom in the oil, you, you see all those flavors coming out. Um, now, again, only the volatile compounds in a dish you know, can give you smells, but, which, but what some people do is you can also make non-volatile compounds volatile by adding alcohol. Therefore, you'll see in a lot of sauces and in pasta sauces and so on, people add wine. Um, this is what happens is what it raises the vapor pressure, lowers the surface tension of the compounds, and therefore they are you know, more likely to get volatile and pass through your chemoreceptors. Uh, this is what people call, call as, uh, 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 sorry, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, this is what uh, people call as cosolvency, right? So the ethanol molecule takes the uh, place of water molecules that are normally attached to the compounds and it they, they, that way it becomes lighter and then it has a higher chance of evaporating. 
Now, um, some chemical structures, they have you know, more distinct smells uh, and families of compounds. Um, for example, esters, they, they have a fruity aroma. Amines have like a sticky, uh, rotting like um, uh, smell. Uh, aldehydes, aldehydes, if you remember from organic chemistry back in school, they're like, chem, uh, they have the, the carbon atom, which is double bonded with oxygen and um, hydrogen. They smell more plant-like, right? So these smells are, these flavors are used in a lot of products like laundry detergents, candles, so on, because they cost less and they are more stable. Uh, like if you look at some of the common ones, like uh, on the, uh, like, uh, like on the stable here, like bananas, almonds, butter, strawberry. These are the, some of the common smells you'll see in a lot of uh, things that you buy. And these are your compounds like isoamyl acetate gives you banana, the banana smell. Benzaldehyde gives you the almond kind of flavor. Uh, diacetyl gives you buttery uh, smell. Uh, furanol gives you strawberry and vanillin gives you uh, vanilla. So it's these smells uh, and these from these compounds that kind of makes you feel that so again vanilla the true vanilla has a lot of things than vanillin you know but vanillin is what gives you that that distinct vanilla flavor that you're wired in your head and what's what you'll see that in a lot of ice creams and extracts and so on uh if that's about smells let's go to tastes right and uh tastes is your gustatory uh sense and we've kind of broken things down into six different um, tastes right so you have your sweet you have your salty you have bitter sour umami and uh, astringent sweet uh, is the most common one because we are hardwired to like sweet foods there's no surprise here uh, sweet tastes you know they signal uh, sweets are uh, quickly digestible and therefore we are drawn towards them but our desire for sweetness, it changes over our lifetime, uh, right? So like we prefer a lot of sweet as we uh, as we're young, but it's kind of slowly decreases. And we kind of wonder why. Our first meal, um, which is, you know, your, uh, your mother's milk is pure sugar and fat. And that's why you're, you're, you're wired because that's the first meal you ever had. So you're always drawn towards sugar uh, and fat as well. And it's the reason also why um, you like a lot of um, chocolate is because sugar and fat are the two biggest um, components in chocolate, right? Um, so that's uh, that's as far as that goes. Um, and let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, salt. So salt, again, it's common, sodium chloride, makes makes everything better you won't find a dish there are very few dishes where you won't have salt even in like uh sweet dishes you know you you add salt because salt filters out the taste of bitterness right and it results thereby in other tastes coming more together strongly so a small quantity of salt enhances the foods it brings together this fullness of of your food um and even if or in cookies or cakes uh, you will have a pinch of salt. Bitter is the only taste that takes learning to like because by naturally and from, from the animal world uh, kingdom as well, bitters is what drives people away, right? So it's more used by plants as a defense mechanism. And so if something's bitter, you know, you don't go to it. So it's an acquired taste. And uh, a, a primitive part of our brain therefore rejects bitter taste by default because like I said, a lot of toxic plants and all that taste bitter. Now, the same primitive mechanism is why bitter foods are unappealing to even kids. Right? They haven't learned to tolerate or forgetting, forget about enjoying the sense of bitterness. Now, salt, like I just told earlier, can neutralize bitterness, which is why when you like slice cucumbers, you know, you apply some salt, it cuts some of the bitterness. Uh, if, of course, if your cucumbers are bitter, uh, when you kind of uh, eat them up. Sour tastes uh, are caused now by acids in foods, right? The, the sensation of sourness is detected by, um, by, 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 by the, by the taste bud when it's interacting with hydrogen ions in the acids. So in a way, your, your 
your taste buds, your sour taste buds is like a pH tester. Um, from, from an evolutionary uh, perspective, if you think about it, we have evolved from uh, using sourness as a method of determining spoilage to now uh, something taste. Because a lot of acids are produced by bacteria during breakdown, right? So if something went sour, that means, you know, it had gone it had gone, it had got spoiled because bacteria was breaking it down and so on. At least when you think, start, as you think about it. Now, it's not to say that sourness is always due to bacterial breakage or that fermentation is, uh, is bad as a bad thing because, you know, Italy batter, <laughs> those are batter that we love is because of fermentation. You know, when you have yeast uh, in, in your other preparations, we like, we like that fermentation or beer or any of those facts, but, uh, at least primitively, that's how you, st you start out, right? Now, um, lemon juice, for example, is sour. It's, that's because of the citric acid in it. Uh, or even yogurt, it acquires a sour taste because of the lactic acid. Um, and that is created by the bacteria that breaks down the lactose in, in your milk. Uh, the next taste is umami, right? Umami is a Japanese word. It roughly trans to savory. And uh, it's that lip smacking sensation, which is which is triggered by amino acids um, or glutamates um, in in your food. Now, glutamates are there in a lot of foods. Uh, mushrooms probably have them in, uh, in the in a, one of the in the highest quantity, seaweed and so on. But glutamates are also found in tomatoes and uh, in other dishes, which is why you'll see a lot of our Indian gravies, you know, have tomatoes in them because the glutamate from the tomatoes gives you that. Um, that savory mouthful uh, feeling. Now, it's interesting because like sweetness, saltness, uh, they are associated with positive attributes of food. Like sweetness gives you a quick, quick release of uh, energy. Salt is, is, you know, is what your blood needs for blood pressure. So, you know, you generally get them. Sourness and bitterness, they indicate kind of potential danger. Like, you know, uh, either the food has gone bad or the plant, you know, is bitter or so on. But Umami is a very subtle indicator and uh, it's not, it's, it doesn't fall in any, any of these. It's a subtle indicator of protein content or um, it's kind of, in, it's, it's a way of telling you that the food that you're ingesting um, has enough amino acids because, you know, your muscle functions need uh, amino acids. And regardless of that, right, uh, umami is worth understanding uh, just for, because of, um, the, of MSG, right? MSG or monosodium glutamate is to umami what sugar is to sweetness. So it's a chemical, it's odorless, but it triggers all your umami receptors uh, in your tongue. Now, uh, MSG or Ajinomoto, it's kind of called, you know, has got a very bad rap, uh, both in India and in the States. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad press, but if you kind of take a step back and look at it, it's more because of, uh, a lot of these people, a lot of these chefs, at least in, in, in the West, were, you know, felt threatened by chefs from, uh, from the East because of the, this flavoring, which a lot of these other dishes, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't stand a chance because of uh, the flavor. So a lot of the press would then say that, you know, MSG is bad and so on and so forth. And in fact, there's fascinating stories of how in the early 80s, um, chefs from uh, China, Japan and all would kind of smuggle uh, small packets of MSG in their clothing as they would come in because, you know, it was, it was like a banned substance and so on. Um, and same thing, even in India, growing up, you know, you would, you would read reports about um, MSG or Ajinomoto causes heart attacks and things like that and kind of, you know, uh, de demonizing it to this very day. Like someone saw it on a, on a food video that I'd put out and sent me a comment. It's dangerous. Why are you using MSG? You shouldn't be using that and kind of sent me this huge five, six paragraph uh, message. But again, we can only try uh, then you have your other taste, right? Uh, your taste buds can pick up other tastes as well, like uh, the irritation bought by chilies. And that's because of uh, the chemical capsaicin, which is in your chili, which, um, which latches on to your tongues. And then your tongue sends that whole signal um, to your brain. It's, it's a neurotransmitter and says, okay, no, I'm in trouble. And that's why you feel heat. Now, a uh, lot of times, you know, uh, people will say or drink water or something, but milk is what you want to use because milk is going to latch on to the capsaicin 
and is going to uh, release it from your tongue rather than water, which will not wash it down. Uh, the these receptors, um, you know, they they are they take more time uh, to they get depleted and they take time to come back to replenish, which is why the more and more hot foods you eat, you kind of slowly build a tolerance for hotter and hotter foods. It doesn't happen with sweet or uh, or salty or any other, but with hot uh, food it happens, which is why you know you give someone a taste and say, oh, tell me if it's too spicy. It probably might be spicy for them, just not for you. So, you know, it's not very safe to jump into that. Um, and then you also have taste like the cooling sensation, you know, which you get from plants like menthol, uh, mint, uh, uh, or something like that. That's a cooling kind of a taste. And then uh, a taste which is very more uh, known in, in the Indian subcontinent than anywhere else is astringency, right? Um, and astringency results when certain compounds bind to your taste uh, receptors and cause like a drying or a puckering reaction. So you see a lot of astringency in um, pomegranates, in teas, um, and uh, so on. Where th that's and so, like for example, you go back to Ayurveda. Ayurveda, ha, you know, lists out astringent as one of the tastes um, and not umami. And the combinations of these is what becomes really interesting. Now you know all the different uh, tastes is like salty and sour, right? Salty and sour we know works because we see it in pickles and salad dressings and so on. Salty and sweet we know because, you know, for example, um, you have chocolate pretzels or you have watermelon feta salad. Do, do those two tastes go really well. Sweet and sour, I mean, you know, we love all oranges, lemonade, so on, um, or even corn when you kind of roast it and you have lime uh, rubbing on it. It's that sweet and sour that comes together. Um, bitter and sweet, you know, apples are bitter and sweet at times. Chocolate is, coffee is a very good example of that. So uh, what I'm trying to get is like a lot of these tastes are separate, but they can come together. And that's what you, you want to be thinking as you're trying to uh, come up with a recipe or trying to think what you could do uh, to a recipe. Um, so then let's see. This is one of my uh, favorite ways of exploration is how you choose, um, how you choose um, uh, your ingredients, right? So uh, when you want to, uh, so the way, one of the ways is called adapt and experiment where you know you take a recipe then you start changing chopping and then you see what you want to do so let's say um and what but what will happen a lot of times is that you know a recipe will kind of go bad because you're just doing way too much experimentation but that's your that's when you want to take a step back and see okay what do i need to do right so let's say if you want to increase the the bitterness in something you know you can add tonic water or if you want to reduce it you increase saltness because salt cuts bitter um, and these are the ways to like you, you salvage your dish because you experimented way too much, right? Or if you want to make something more sour, you add lemon juice, vinegar, or to reduce sourness, you know, you increase your sweetness. Um, umami, like I said, comes from tomatoes, comes from mushrooms, MSG, soy sauce. That's how you increase the umami, which is why you'll see this a lot of in your um, noodles and Chinese dishes and soups, uh, those soupy uh, Manchurians and things like that. Um, and the only way to reduce umami if you have too much of it is is, is not just dilution um, you can increase sweet by obviously sugar honey maple syrup so on but if you want to reduce it then you have to kind of increase your sourness or increase the heat to reduce something which, which has gone way too sweet uh, same thing with salt you know umami based ingredients have salt because soy sauce or some of these are obviously salty uh, but then if you want to reduce salt you kind of increase your sweetness Adapting and experimenting is fun, but just make sure you have this in the back of your pocket because a lot of times things will kind of go haywire as you're experimenting uh, way too much with your dishes. Uh, but it's a very fun way of choosing ingredients because you just say, okay, what if I take this, this, and this, what will happen? But then <laughs> you just need to make sure you uh, have something as a backup. And again, don't feel bad about burning dinners, right? it's always okay to burn dinners. You have Maggie, you'll be fine. You can order pizza, you'll be fine. Uh, another way to choose ingredients, and uh, I like this a lot, is by regional or traditional means, where you identify by region what they use for each of these tastes, 
and therefore if you take a, a recipe that's made from a particular region how can you make it uh, how can you adapt it to uh, an indian taste or a chinese taste or something like that right um and a lot of people look down upon stuff like this but i don't care you know that's the whole point is there are no rules in the kitchen so like for example um in 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 chinese cuisine right uh, bitter comes from bitter melon salty comes from soy msg sourness bring is comes from rice wine vinegar sweetness comes from plum sauce umami comes from oyster sauce dried mushrooms uh, and the heat it comes from sichuan peppers chili oil and so on now if you picked a, a chinese recipe you will see these flavors uh, these uh, ingredients or similar ones bringing in some of these tastes um and then if you go to let's say the french or greek they they differ but you can see how you can you can start sp spotting common trends like for example in sar right uh, you will see the french use red wine vinegar uh, the greeks use lemon but they're all giving you that it's acid that they're imparting so you can see why uh, they're using what they're using or for example they use feta cheese and someone else is using capers but at the end you're going for that pickled saltiness from a caper or that saltiness that feta cheese gives you versus how the chinese use soy or msg or so on right and you can very well take a um like a like a italian dish or something and then say what if i just swap out these um these flavors and use and you know substitute them instead with something from any of these other countries what will happen to it that's really nice experiment i've done a few sometimes they work out really well sometimes not so much but it is fun to kind of uh, do that um and so then let's see if you then same way if you go in in, in indian pasta, cuisine like bitterness tamarind sauce sorry i've done pasta with uh, tamarind to make ah, it yes more uh, you know tangy and sour and it's just just gives one such a burst of flavor tamarind on pasta and and that's 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 exactly because and i'll i'll see a lot of posts on twitter or instagram where people like people will, you know take someone else's post and say yuck you know i'd rather die than eat this or and it's because you've been conditioned in your mind a certain way that you know pasta has to just taste this way or um uh you know chole has to just be like this or noodles should only be like this it's it's your conditioning uh rather than anything else which is kind of making you think on those terms and you instantly reject something just the very idea of it um you know kind of is 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 something that you you want to detest rather than you know maybe taste it maybe you maybe it may maybe nice you don't know but uh that whole snobbery that we we have this ingrained snobbery of uh, when we look at dishes and like recently there was this thing where someone had made polenta um it was i think in one of the episodes of master chef or something and then someone was like oh this is just upma what a big deal of you know you can make why are you making upma in a finale and what's a big deal with that but it, it's that's our whole conditioning and one of the things also gets me a lot of times when people say how do you get the authentic taste in this dish uh, <laughs> and my my wife also you know we i make fun of her a lot and she'll use a word and she'll get okay i know what you're going to say what do you mean by authentic taste right is is the authentic taste the taste that you grew up eating when you're you know, in your home and now that is the way that is the authentic taste for let's say like a like a sambar or like a uh, like a coconut chutney and now you're looking for that everywhere else it's not authentic it's just that something you've been conditioned for the last 20 30 years of your life and now you just think that that's how sambar or whatever should taste like uh or if you've gone to a restaurant and then you've been served this kadai paneer and then actually a lot of restaurants the kadai paneer tastes exactly the same it's a rubbery mess floating in a in an orange sea of uh, gravy you just think that is the authentic way uh, or the, that is the way of kadai paneer or whatever whatever you you need to start thinking that's just how the restaurant that your favorite restaurant has been making it doesn't mean anyone making it differently is you know any less uh, than the other and the, the goal here i'm trying to go for is also that right um is to get get try to kind of dissociate dissociate all this conditioning that you have in your mind and kind of think uh, with an open mind um now let's say 
So you have bitters, right? You have hing, methi, karela is what you give, gives you bitter flavors. Uh, whereas in Italian cooking, you have olives, artichokes, that's what gives you bitter. You can see the common thread uh, if you, as you put this into a table structure. If you go down, you can see they're all related. And therefore, you can try substituting them or you don't, but you can also now start seeing why uh, a polenta, an upma, uh, or a cornmeal, they all are kind of similar to each other, right? It's, 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 you, you see that thread kind of flow through uh, across cultures and across regions is because not just not, it's, it's not that someone stole your recipe or your culture's recipe. They just brought in the same set of uh, flavors for all, but using ingredients that grow locally there are sourced locally and it kind of now uh, is very similar to what you do. Um, let's see, we can still keep going on this, you know, across, if you go to Southeast Asia, Latin America, there are quite opposites, but you will see how uh, some things are still similar, right? So in Southeast Asia, you'll see you use a lot of tamarind, but even in Latin America, you see tamarind being used. Um, now, a lot of these uh, Indonesian and Thai uh, uh, preparations, you'll see the fermented bean paste, whereas Latin America, you see a lot of tomatoes and um, so on being used. So uh, now, and, and my, my, my whole goal, like I said, is just to get those things out, like jalapenos, ha habaneros. Uh, growing now, now in the US, I've, I love the habanero a lot more. Um, but that doesn't mean that bird, I don't buy birds at chilies from the Thai store when I get a chance for, right? Um, they are all uh, still giving you that heat, but then the heat that you get from a birds at chilies is still different from the heat from a habanero. It's a, you know, it's a different kind of a heat, but they're all substitutable and you can see why uh, you would want to use them. Um, another way of picking ingredients is seasonal. And now, you know, with global of supply chain for and logistics, you get apples throughout the year, you know, in January, in April also you get apples or, um, uh, or, or anything like that. But th there is inherently something special about eating, uh, consuming ingredient in the season that it is known to grow. Like, um, despite, you know, it being flash frozen or, you know, and served, brought to you later of, or it's being shipped from somewhere in Latin America where I still get bananas, even when it's like, there's a snowstorm outside and I'm still getting bananas uh, at my store, at, at the grocery store. But when you are eating something that's in season, it's naturally fresher. You can actually uh, feel that taste. Like for example, let's say you make a peach jam. If you make a peach jam in the summer, that will taste a lot different from a peach jam that you made with peaches that you bought in, in winter. Um, so that's, that, that's one of those things is uh, trying to appreciate what grows locally. And a lot of our dishes, if you actually see, uh, you'll see these winter dishes, summer dishes and so on. Like my mom, she's like a very big proponent of that. And uh, she's like, you know, eat what, eat winter things in the winter, eat what grows in the summer, in the summer, you know, cucumbers and things like that, watermelon, eat those in the summer. Again, here I get watermelon even in winters, but you know, that's what we're trying to say is that the freshness of a watermelon that you get in the summer is not going to be matched by something you get uh, way in the winter or like uh, apples. Like I went apple picking yesterday to an orchard and you know, it's taking apples from the tree and the crunch that you, you get, it's not the taste that comes from the apple. Your the the crunch gives you that your ears are perked up by the crunch that uh, that also adds to the taste and that same crunch won't be in an apple that I find in March or something when it's when I'm buying it uh, from a grocery store. So choosing an ingredient seasonally is a challenge, but it's also a very interesting challenge because um, now you are trying to restrict yourself to what grows locally where you are in that very season. And again, un unless you're living in, like in the far north where it's like snowing for six months of the year or something, but at least in a more um, tropical climate, well, you know, especially if you're in India or so on, cooking with things which are local and seasonal probably is going to be a lot better. Again, it's a, it, it presents an interesting challenge. And the, the, all the, what I'm trying to say, all of these are just trying ways to feel how we can pick out our ingredients, right? Um, you pick out ingredients because you want to adapt and experiment. You just want to see, oh, what will endives and artichoke, will they go together? That's your experimenting ways. You're picking them by 
uh, cultures and see, okay, what, how would the Chinese do this? Or how would the Greek add salt? And maybe if I can use that in one of my dishes or like Narika said, you know, pasta and uh, tamarind, which I should try now. Or even amchur powder, as I think about that. Um, or you could do it seasonally. One of my favorite ways and which I do often is the analytical method is where I, I'm, I read every all of I read, I read a lot of recipes. I put them together and then I think, okay, what if I do this that this recipe did? Pick this that some other recipe did. Pick this that some other recipe did, and what what comes together? You know, because now we're looking at things more from an analytical standpoint of what will happen when I bring the common ideas that these different flavors do and put them together. Let's say if you're making okay, on this slide, I have if you're making chutneys, right? You can start picking any. Uh, you need a base, right? If it's coconut chutney or tomato chutney or mango chutney or a, you know, onion chutney, anything, you need one of the bases. You pick a base, whatever you want from here. You need to add a souring element. You pick again, whatever you want. You can add lemon juice or kokum, dry mango, yogurt. And then there is a tempering, right? These are your basic building blocks of any chutney that you make. The, the analytical way of coming at it is, okay, yes, there is a way that the, uh, you know, the, the Adigas or the MTR or the Swati Tiffins will make coconut chutney, but does coconut chutney always have to be made that way, right? You start kind of taking a step back and thinking that way or like tomato chutney or whatever you get. And then now you can pick and choose. So I, you can now pick anything from this category. You pick something from here, pick something from here, you try it out. It may be good, may not be good. But that's your analytical way of doing it, where you're now thinking, okay, this uh, selection six, five, and three did not work, but maybe something, then you're trying to figure out why it didn't work. Sorry about the slide. Um, and it's not a very uh, weird thing to do. So if you're, here, let's, let's do something right now. Um, let us create something, let's say for sauces, right? We can do one right now as we go. So uh, if you're making soups, uh, let's say we make soups. Uh, what are the things we can make soups with? Let's see if I can get something on the chat. Um, I'll put, I'll start putting on a few pumpkin, right? Um, I'm going to add, I'm going to add pumpkins. I'm going to add tomatoes. Let's see. We can do spinach. We can do what else? Um, sorry. Grated coconut. Coconut. Okay. Um, and cream let's pick some cream in to soup. No, when you, when you need, so it's coconut is a fantastic thing to add to. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm trying to give through, uh, our, our picking our bases. So okay. for, yeah. So we'll use coconut milk here. We'll use cream. We'll use, let's say, um, cornstarch. So these are your thickening agents. Your thickening agents are these, you're, you're using something from here. And then let's say if you're doing seasoning, uh, in seasoning, you have, um, thyme, uh, you have thyme, you have rosemary, you have oregano, you have um, garam masala. Um, then let's say you can add sriracha and uh, five spice. And then you can add cumin, coriander, and then you need your aromatics. And for your aromatics, we have ginger, we have garlic, we have onions, we have carrots, we have celery. Okay. So yeah, we just made this up as we went. Now, if you're going to make a soup, you can pick one from here, right? You pick one of your vegetables that you're making a soup with. Um, you Let's say you have potatoes. You have potatoes um yeah you you pick what or corn you have corn you have peas you you take one from here and then you prepare it you know if it's peas or corn you're going or or a, uh, you're going to kind of uh, kind of roast you're going to cook them a bit if it is spinach or any of those greens you, or, or kale kale is another one um you're going to kind of blanch them maybe if it's pumpkin or potatoes, you're gonna probably gonna bake them. However, you pick you pick one from here. Then you need your aromatics. You pick one, you pick two, you pick all all of them if you want, right? And then that's what you're gonna to blend together. Then you you bring your thickening agent. You either add cream, you add coconut milk, uh, you add cornstarch, 
that what's that's what thickens it up and then you pick what seasoning you want on it in addition to salt and pepper of course but then now based on what you pick you have a different soup right and this is your the the analytical way of looking at it is where you there is no set recipe right there won't be a recipe that says pumpkin soup with coconut milk garam masala and celery why not it'll taste good trust me i have done i i i have actually a video that's coming out uh, i still haven't edited but uh, did a lot of co coconut milk uh, in pumpkins and it's it makes a brilliant thing or let's say if you're doing a pea a corn soup actually you can start seeing this so uh, one of the most famous soups you will get in indo chinese cuisine is your sweet corn soup right so you have corn uh, uh, you have peas and corn you have corn starch um, they'll add a bit of cumin coriander and you'll have garlic in it that's your sweet corn soup or your pea soup so i think we're seeing the uh, the table you've just drawn up we're still seeing the slide oh my bad oh what do i do i have been furiously typing away for the last 5 minutes like an idiot the end result rather than the process which is uh, how it yeah uh oh, hello okay one second let me do this let me move this guy to here here okay better yeah i think so okay so sorry about that <laughs> i didn't realize what was happening um so So, yeah, so you're picking something from here. You're picking one of your vegetables. You pick uh, whatever you want is your thickening agent. You pick what you want for your aromatics. You pick something for seasoning, and that ends up being your soup. So the same uh, logic that we applied to make chutneys, you apply that to soup. You apply that even to curries or you know a lot of your gravies because you know you have a fixed set of uh, gravies uh, or um, like for example in a lot of South Indian cooking, you know like torans or things that you know. you're going to use grated coconut you're going to use cumin you're going to use um asafoetida or hing i'm going to call it hing from now on it's too, way too many alphabets to pronounce uh that's what you use and then you just start changing the vegetables in your toran and it's a different one each time not, may not be the way your ma your mom your your grandmom has made it but it is now your way of making it same thing goes for a lot of these um or at least what is sold as indian food in a lot of restaurants these days like you know there is this one common orangeish base um and sometimes it's more red than orange and then you have a variety of things that are floating in it sometimes you have mushrooms floating in it sometimes you have paneer floating in it sometimes you have chicken floating in it sometimes you'll have uh um uh, you know and anything else but it's that same gravy or the same base and you're just adding things uh from the side so if you start thinking or attacking a recipe that way you will come up with your own variations and as you look at look at this uh, excel sheet that we just came up and like as we went you can make at least 50 to 60 different types of soups right here right uh, you just making different choices and if you remember permutations and combinations right <laughs> you're choosing something in uh, you know you choose something from here and then that's how you go um that's the as far as choosing ingredients these are the different ways i i used and i kind of uh, encourage people to do because again you're not sticking to what someone said but you're discovering your own um, ways um now that we've done ingredients we've looked at tools one of the things we wanted to we should probably talk about is our friends time and temperature mm -hmm. right and time and temperature play a very important role in whatever you cook so you will have things which are slow roasting you'll have things that are quick boils stir fries but it's time and temperature it's a combination of both of that is what is doing it for you here now there are three things at least when you're looking at temperature uh, that come in and those are denaturation of proteins mayer reactions and caramelization right so now the native form of a protein if you think about it it's a three dimensional shape and um that and that's what the protein has for normal functioning now this structure can be disrupted by heat or by acid and then when that is dis uh, disturbed the protein is supposed is called as denatured right and the changes in the shape of protein 
alters the taste and texture. So that's what happens. Let's say if you have, um, you know, you're, you, you're searing chicken or, or, or meat or something like that, the protein is getting denatured and that's what gives, you, gives it that taste and texture versus eating raw, raw meat. Now, uh, different proteins, they need denature at different temperatures, um, but mostly they're between 50 to 70 centigrade, right? Uh, let's take egg whites, since we've been talking about eggs for a while now. Eggs begin to denature around 60 centigrade or 140 Fahrenheit. And that's when, um, you know, when you break an egg, it's transparent, but then it turns white because the shape of the denature protein is no longer transparent to visible light. Um, in meats, however, uh, there's a protein that's my, uh, myosin and that denatures around 50 centigrade, 120 Fahrenheit or so. Um, and another protein, actin, uh, that begins to denature around 65 centigrade, 150 Fahrenheit. Um, and most people prefer meat cooked at cooked such that the myosin is denatured, but the actin is um, is still native because that's when that's that uh, mix so that it doesn't get too rubbery, but it's still cooked uh, and so on. Right? That's uh, that's where that's how proteins denature. Now, Maillard reactions. Maillard reactions happen in foods that we eat all the time. We just don't realize them, uh, and we just don't know what they're called. Now. A Maillard reaction is the browning reaction that gives foods um, an aromatic and a mouth-watering aroma, right? It is usually triggered by heat. And this occurs when an amino acid and a certain types of sugar, they break down and recombine into hundreds of different compounds. And the byproducts of this are um, smells and um, they depend upon the amino acids that are present in the food that are being cooked. Like, uh, for example, now um, like chicken, right? When chicken is getting roasted, that crispy skin and the smell, that is, that, that is brought on by a made reaction. Um, now, in, in most culinary uh, processes, made reactions start getting noticeable around 154 um, centigrade, 300, 300 Fahrenheit. And um, it depends upon the pH uh, of the chemical re reagents that are in the food um, and how much they are, right? So, um, which is why, you know, if you are cooking, let's say if you're cooking meat below uh, 150 Fahrenheit, you won't see any Maillard reactions. And again, it's important because water boils at 100, that's where you don't see any Maillard reactions when you're boiling, uh, when you're, when you're uh, boiling, uh, uh, something in water because it's only at, it caps out at 100, but then these start occurring at 150 and so on. Caramelization is that next step going ahead, right? Caramelization occurs with the breakdown of sugar, right? And very much like the Maillard reaction, it generates hundreds of compounds. They smell delicious, which is why, you know, caramelization smells so good. Baking is one of the biggest examples of that. Um, your whole house smells wonderful. Now, <clears throat> Pure sucrose, right? Um, that's what you have in your granulated sugar. That caramelizes between like around 160 to 200 Fahrenheit, or 300 and um, or like 320 to uh, 400 uh, uh, Fahrenheit, or sorry, 160 to 200 centigrade. Um, and that brings out all your rich flavors. And therefore, in a lot of baking, you will see a good a lot of baking is happens around the 190 plus in centigrades or 375 and above. A lot of baking, you know, will happen around 400 Fahrenheit, because you'll have this brown exterior. Um, and whereas if you're baking something, let's say below 170 centigrade or 350 Fahrenheit, you'll be they'll be less browning. That's because the caramelization isn't occurring. So cookies and uh, so on will be baked at higher temperatures versus and, um, you know, things that you don't want them to go that way, you bake at lower temperature, like butter cookies or something, because you don't want the butter to kind of burn out at that, at that higher temperature. Um, now, when, when you uh, look at that, as we simply mentioned baking, you have heat transfer, right? And heat transfer is important because whatever we are cooking, you're, you're imparting heat to, you know, your the eggs or, uh, or, um, you know, or, or uh, whatever you're trying to make. And there's different ways of how this heat is imparted, right? So you have conduction, convection, and radiation. Now, in uh, conduction, 
these methods are where heat is transferred directly by contact between the food and the hot material. You know, like um, eggs meeting a, a hot skillet. That is that is conduction. Um, now this causes the thermal energy from the skillet to be transferred onto the egg and the neighborhood molecules, and therefore uh, that then equalizes the temperature because the entire egg is meeting that surface at the same time. Um, now, sorting, searing, all of that is conduction. Convection, however, is where the heat is transferring through either uh, through a medium, right? So either air um, or, or, or water or oil or something like that, right? So baking, roasting, boiling, steaming, all of these work on that same principle of a hot material is what is imparting uh, hot medium, sorry, is imparting uh, the heat. So in baking and roasting, it's the hot air. In boiling and steaming, it's the water vapor. Or in deep frying, it's the hot oil, right? Um, and then in these, you can, you can put them as two different methods. There is the wet method and the hot method, right? Um, the wet method has water and oil, whereas the, um, the, the dry heat method is, you know, your baking, roasting, and so forth. Um, now, what happens in, in, in the wet methods is, the, in the, especially like boiling and so on, they don't reach the temperature required for uh, mayored reactions or caramelization, right? Um, versus, I mean, technically, if you do, if you pressure cook, you can still get uh, some mayored reactions going. Um, but a lot of your uh, flavorful compounds from mayored reactions, you'll see them in grilling or oven roasted items uh, versus seeing them in um, something that's stewed or braised or so on. So um, if you're steaming carrots, um, they won't see any caramelization versus if you're searing the carrot or uh, you're baking or, ba you're ba or broiling the carrot or so on, right? And the broiled carrot, the, that charred flavor that you get on a bo broiled carrot is very different from what you get from a steamed carrot. Um, just try it. It's, it's, it's a mind-blowing experience what that simple carrot can do in both these different um, mediums. Um, and then you have uh, uh, radiation, right? Radiation is the heat that is transferred via electromagnetic radiation. Now, it doesn't always mean, um, um, it doesn't always mean a, a microwave, but it could also be from charcoal. So when people do a lot of grilling and so on, it's the hot coal from below that's getting, uh, you know, the hot coals, the, air, the hot air comes up and that's what's heating, uh, heating things, right? When you're doing a tandoor or something like that, um, or also, you know, microwaves where you're using electromagnetic waves to kind of cook. Um, Ken, last week, uh, uh, we had uh, Kitchen Ken Prof who did a brilliant session on uh, microwaves. I don't want to go too much into that. Uh, I think it's available on the archives uh, on uh, the Kilter website. But however you, whatever method of heat transfer you use, again, it's just important to come to think about what are you trying to go for, right? Let's take that example of the carrot, right? You can boil the carrot, you can sear the carrot, you can grill the carrot, right? You can do all three things with that same carrot. And it's a very nice experiment to try out because the taste will differ in each of these. Now the, the steamed carrot will be a lot softer, but it will be cooked and you'll, um, but whereas the, the seared carrot, you know, it'll be harder, but you'll have a nice sear to it because of, uh, of the, 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 the skillet that you had. And then you're, when you're putting it in, into the oven, you, know, you get a nice char, but you know, it loses a lot of the water. So kind of, you see kind of shrink a bit and so on. So it depends on where you want to use it. So if you're going to make a soup or something, char the carrots and then, you know, puree them together, you'll have that smoky uh, flavor in that in there versus if you're going to make like a thorn or something like that, you, you want to taste the carrot. You don't want to be shrunk into uh, nothing, right? So that's when, you know, you'll see uh, steaming your carrots along with, um, or if you're making like a parapusli or whatever you want to do, you know, that's where uh, you would see those things. So you can choose to, uh, you can choose your methods of uh, heat transfer, but again, they all, um, because of the temperatures, the maximum temperatures and uh, they can impart, that's what happens. Now, the, the thing to consider here is oil. I just mentioned, right? So water, because it caps out at hundred um, centigrade, you know, it doesn't, you, you cannot get any browning going, but oil, because you know, the, the smoke point is a lot higher, 
That's why you see a lot of frying happening in oil because you can impart a lot more heat to your uh, to what you're frying versus you know boiling it or anything else. And oil, obviously, you know the fat gets stuck to the um, to what are you making, so your budgie or something like that, and then you know obviously it impacts a lot of flavor from the fat. But you're using oil more for cooking it, uh, but sometimes it's, it's also a taste enhancer. Um, I just wanted to leave you with one last thing. And that's about the different temperatures. And uh, so that you can kind of get an idea of what we do. And uh, you have an, a mental idea of when you're trying to make something or planning out your next dish of what you want to see it's because you pick your temperatures accordingly, right? So um, now proteins, for example, um, uh, at least in like meat and fish and so on, uh, when people like are biting into them, you know, it's the, you you don't want to chew too much, right? It's that that total chewing work or the total texture preference, and that's what you want to bring down, which is why you denature or uh, you're cooking your uh, your protein, and the that temperature that we just spoke about, you know, happens around uh, happens around the 104 Fahrenheit to 122 Fahrenheit or 40 to 50 centigrade uh, mark, and and and, and this is when the 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 myosin and the collagen will denature but the actin will remain and therefore you know meat if especially red meat or you know will have that pinkish color uh, which people kind of prefer um, eggs you know they set around at like 62 centigrade 144 um, and then eggs are my favorite and clearly you can see i've mentioned it so many times in this entire session because i feel it's like the wonder food of the kitchen you know they have a light part they have a dark part and they bind the entire culinary world together, right? From uh, baking to cooking to frying. Um, you know, they're used in savory and sweet foods. They are binders. Uh, they are rising agents in, in in souffles and cakes and so on. They are emulsifiers if you're doing like a meringue, um, and in, or sauces and uh, like a hollandaise sauce or something. Um, and if you're making like a custard, the eggs is what gives it the structure. Um, also in ice creams, you know, you use you have eggs and all of this doesn't even touch the flavor of, and we're not even talking about simple, like a simple cooked egg, right? That itself is a different flavor bomb in itself. So that's why I love eggs so much. And now the most heat sensitive protein in egg is your um, overtransferrin, right? And that denatures around 62, uh, 62 centigrade, 140 uh, Fahrenheit, right? And another protein, the overalbumin, that denatures around 80 centigrade. And these two proteins are, are uh, is what you have in your egg whites, right? So you have your overtransferrin that that's like twelve percent, and your overalbumin is fifty four percent of 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 the egg white. And this is the difference between like a soft boiled egg and a hard boiled egg, right? So if you get that egg up to let's say eighty centigrade for a sufficient amount of time, the that white is cooked at that temperature, but the uh, overalbumin proteins they remain. And therefore, you know, your egg is still in a semi-liquid state. It has become white, but it's in a semi-liquid state. That's what you get with soft boiled eggs, right? So that's kind of important because depending on what you're trying to go for, you know, you have the temperature gradient in your mind. Um, and then let's say collagen. Collagen denatures at around 60, 68 um, centigrade. Um, and th this is the most common type of protein uh, in connective tissue. Right, and you know there are different types of collagen in in, in animals, but um, the 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 difference between different types of collagen is the temperature at which they denature. Right now, in cooking, you'll see collagen is in you know in in especially if you're cooking uh, meats and so on in like the tendons and the skins and the muscle networks. You know you'll have it, and it is tough, right? And so it becomes palatable only when it gets a certain temperature. Uh, that's the temperature that you're going for. Vegetables, however, you know, um, are slightly higher and uh, you, it's the starch that breaks down and kind of gelatinizes. That's what makes vegetables taste good versus raw. Um, so vegetables, a lot of vegetables at least are compromised of co uh, carbohydrates like cellulose, starch and pectin. And uh, unlike the proteins in meat, which are extensively, which are very sensitive to heat, they can, you know, a lot of too much heat and your chicken can become like shoe leather or something. Um, vegetables are more forgiving. Right, vegetables are more forgiving uh, at even at higher temperatures, 
and that that's so for example one of the things um, uh, it's very common is that when you are making potatoes like when you're trying to roast potatoes one of the things to do is to like add a pinch of baking soda kind of parboil them and then peel and then kind of um, put them on the stove because what that does is pectin like i mentioned earlier the baking soda kind of break, breaks down all the pectin uh, so then that kind of creates ridges on the uh, on the surface of your potato so then when you take that parboiled potato with baking soda in it and then when you use it uh, on your skillet you get mm, your roasted potatoes a lot more lot better than just you know and they cook a lot faster also because they are already parboiled versus chop dicing up your potatoes and then waiting and then you know constantly scraping um, your skillet so uh, cooking starchy vegetables you know it this like potatoes especially causes the starches to gelatinize and um, in the raw form the starches are semi crystalline but uh, but then cooking melts them down and then they are easily broken down uh, by your digestion so you can eat raw potatoes but then you know you eat too many raw potatoes and you kind of feel uh, weird versus cooking them down or you know like roast potatoes is a, is a common staple at least in my house like uh, rasam and like that potato curry is what uh, you know is, is my go to when my mom used to make them is because now they are you can eat a lot more of it than trying to eat like a raw potato um and like with most uh, other reactions in cooking at the point at which starch granules gelatinize depends upon not just temperature it also the type of the starch because different um, and the length of the temperature of how much it's given to it also depends on how much moisture there is right so don't hold me to oh you know you said it is 70 degrees centigrade well that's generally around which and differs by vegetable to vegetable but for a rough idea keep that in mind uh and then mayer reactions we just spoke about mayer reactions mayer reactions happen uh, around 310 fahrenheit 154 centigrade and they aren't solely depend upon depend upon temperature as well right there is also other factors now alkaline foods they undergo mayer reactions more easily like egg whites we spoke about um they can undergo mayer reactions at a lower temperature um uh, or higher pressures of like a pressure cooker uh, and the amount of water um, and the types of reactants uh, occurs also kind of affects your mayer reactions now uh therefore uh, let's see um, oh yeah sugars so sugars gelatinize uh, ca- caramelize at around 180 centigrade and that's what we spoke about in uh, baking and as well is that you see a- at the temperature you actually see a b- bit of both mayer reactions as well as caramelization and um, uh, that's happening and a lot of your baked goods um the the enjoyable aromas that you get you know have that and so for example coffee or roasted nuts or some of these other ones also you know you see that temperature is what is giving you um all of that 